来，在开始上今天课程之前，有一件事情要宣布。嗯、um, ，上次有说我十二月六号那天没办法来，所以要补课。我们补课选在九月二十九号下星期四的早上第三节一路到中午结束，所以是十点十分到十二点五十，地点在一一七零九。我约这个教室之前都不知道一一栋有七楼，一一七零九，啊，没办法来的同学没关系的，我们只是看电影而已。那可以来的话呢，希望你们尽量都来。OK， let's continue. Line fourteen. India, China, and Korea. Are the top three countries? Again, it would be better if there is a comma between China and and. These three countries send a combined 179,093 students to the United States. Um, this is a more efficient way of saying that when combined, these three countries send this many students. A combined result is like a total number of students. Taiwan ranks fifth in U.S. international student enrollment. This is also a very interesting word, the word ranks. Uh, as a verb, it just means the ranking is, um, in this case, number five. You will also sometimes see the passive form, Bei Dong Yu Qi. Taiwan is ranked fifth. It's also a common way to say this. And what is the ranking about? You use the word in, in student enrollment. But if the list of things has a name, you would use the word on, on a list of something. Uh, with 28,017 students attending graduate schools, uh, of course, graduate schools are uh, if you graduate from college and you want to keep studying, you would go to graduate school. In England, they call this postgraduate school, which makes more sense because to graduate means to complete your college education. Uh, and postgraduate, the beginning post means after. So postgraduate is after you graduate. It makes more sense. But in um, the American system, these are simply called graduate schools, schools for people who have graduated. Uh, so you have graduate schools, undergraduate programs, which is what you are doing, and non-degree or ESL programs. So non-degree programs are programs that don't give you a college degree. Instead, they might give you a kind of certificate, 证书, to prove that you have finished the program. The other thing is ESL. ESL stands for English as a Second Language. So these are programs for people who are non-native speakers of English, people like you. Um, and it looks a bit different in countries where most people are native speakers. In Taiwan, our English classes are mostly uh, for non-native speakers. So 
the entire course is designed uh, and taught, uh, designed for and taught by people who are not native speakers. But in the United States, the goal is not just to let you understand the language, it's also to help you become accustomed to the local culture, to help you, as they say, integrate into society. So ESL programs, English as a second language. Uh, in Taiwan, I think our programs are called EFL, English as a foreign language. So there's a little difference in uh, what we teach and how we teach it, right? Our goal is not to help you become American. It's simply to help you understand and use English. Okay, let's uh, keep going. Line 18. While the majority of Taiwan's 48,103 students who studied abroad in 2002, that's the subject, went to the US. Other popular destinations included the United Kingdom, Australia, and Japan. Uh, so this word, while, in fact, in Chinese, we would translate this as suiyan, although. Uh, the English word while, of course, usually means at the same time as. Um, but in this kind of sentence, the point is to emphasize that two different things that happen at the same time are actually going in opposite directions. So the first direction is so many students from Taiwan studied in the US. The second direction is that some students also went to other places. So it's two different directions happening at the same time. Uh, and this is why uh, the sentence begins with while. Um, uh, you can use the word while like this. You can also use the word although, as I just did. Another word you can put in this place is whereas. Whereas simply means the, there are two different things going on. Um, uh, again, United Kingdom, Australia, and Japan. Uh, when you write in English, I would hope that you put a comma here. United Kingdom. Uh, as we all know, includes England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Also a few uh, islands and other territories around the world. You remember from high school history class that uh, the UK is known as the empire on which the sun never sets. It's actually still true. The UK has just enough territory in the Pacific Ocean and in many small islands around the world that it's still true that the sun always shines somewhere on the UK. Now let's continue. In 2002, 7,583 students attended programs in the UK and 2,397 attended programs in Australia, and 1,696 studied in Japan. Okay, this sentence should also be a list. I'm not quite sure why there's an and here. It should be A, comma, B, comma, and C, right? So many students went to the UK, comma, so many went to Australia, comma, and so many went to Japan. So I'm not quite sure why uh, the grammar looks like this.
the most popular majors for foreign students in the United States are business and management, engineering, math and computer sciences, or one of the social sciences. Um, so as you know, majors are the degree that you are studying for. Um, notice that some of these majors are not just one thing, right? Business and management go together. Math and computer sciences go together. They're one thing. Line 24. In addition to overseas Chinese attending programs in Taiwan, a steadily increasing number of foreign students have been coming to Taiwan as well. So overseas Chinese, in Chinese we call that Hua Chao. Uh, another way to say this in English is the Chinese diaspora. The word diaspora means people who have spread out uh, throughout the world because they can't stay at home. Uh, in Chinese, we call this Li San Mingzu. The most famous diaspora is the Jewish people. For many hundreds of years, they didn't have a home. Israel uh, was only re-established after World War II. So before then, Jewish people were a people without a home. They were a diaspora. Um, now, Chinese people do have a home, but many of them, especially um, between 1950 and 1990, uh, many Chinese people felt that um, neither China nor Taiwan was uh, a good enough place to live. China for obvious reasons, uh, Taiwan because uh, at that time we were still under martial law, jie yin. Uh, so many Chinese people tried to find a better life in another country. So because they spread throughout the world um, and didn't, uh, were not able to go home or did not feel like they belonged at home. We also call them a diaspora. Uh, so the term overseas Chinese does not include China, Hong Kong, Macau. Uh, so at near the end of line 24, a steadily increasing number. So it's not just more and more, but each year is more than the year before. It's steadily increasing. Line 25. In 2002, 6,380 foreign students enrolled in programs in Taiwan. Uh, and when we say programs, we we don't just mean like departments. She saw. We also include like language programs, exchange programs, short term programs, uh, many different ways that people can come study in Taiwan. The most popular topics with six thousand one hundred fifty seven students were the humanities. Uh, when we talk about the humanities, we always uh, use this form, the humanities, Fu uh, Shu. Just like um, on line 23, we said the social sciences, so we culture it. Same thing, the social sciences, Fu Shu. Uh, so what kind of humanities? Line 27, mainly Chinese language. So look at this. It says 6,380 foreign students came. 
And of those people, 6,157 came to study Chinese. Which means that only 123 foreign students came to study something else in 2002. Most of Taiwan's foreign students are Asian. The Japanese were the largest group studying in Taiwan with 1,521 students, followed by 1,158 Indonesian students. Uh, Indonesia is Ingi. And 1,038 Korean students. Um, so it says followed by. We know that the word follow means to go after someone or to go after something. So this is a spatial metaphor. As you go, when you arrange the list of countries according to number of students, the first one is Japan, and the one after that is Indonesia. So we say that the second one follows the first one, Jingenzaiho. Let's continue line 29. Americans had the highest enrollment from Western countries with 790 students. Now, usually I would write Western with a capital W, W. And this is because uh, we call these countries Western countries not because they're literally in the West. Western is uh, no longer just a direction. It's also a name for a group of countries that have a similar cultural background. So for example, Australia is a Western country, even though it is located in the East. Uh, so in order to differentiate between geographical West and cultural West, um, I, usually we would write cultural West using a capital W. And we would write geographical West as a direction with a lowercase w. In this case, uh, talking about Western countries, it's a kind of culture. So it would be better to use a capital W. Canada was second with 250 students attending programs in Taiwan. OK, line 32. American students are also participating in study abroad programs in record numbers. Again, we have a new way of presenting this term study abroad. Look at line 37 here. Study abroad programs, three words. But here on line 32, study abroad programs is two words because study and abroad are put together. Um, so again, I don't know why there is this difference. If there's no meaningful difference, then the author should have chosen one way to write the word and continued using the same way. So when it says in record numbers, it means that um, each year is well, maybe not each year, but like recently, the number is the highest that it's ever been. It has broken a new record or it has broken the record. It has set a new record. So these are record numbers. Record numbers could sometimes mean record low numbers. 
but in this case, we're talking about more and more people, so it's record high numbers. It depends on the context. Line 33. During the 2002 academic year, 160,920 students went abroad to study, a 4.4% increase from the previous year. Notice the word increase. When it is a verb, we say increase. Here it's a noun, so we say increase. Depending on whether it's a verb or a noun, we pronounce it a bit differently. Many words work the same way. Uh, for many words, if it's a verb, you pronounce the last or second uh, syllable. If it's a noun, you stress the first syllable. Uh, for example, the word invite. I invite you to my party. For some reason, uh, people in uh, America now sometimes use the word invite as a noun. Let me send you an invite to my party. And in this case, you would stress the first syllable, invite, because it's a noun. Uh, and it says it's an increase from the previous year. Another way to say this is that it's an increase on the previous year. Uh, it's added to the previous year. So you, you would use on, like more and more added on top. Continuing. The most popular destinations for American students were the United Kingdom, Italy, and Spain. So this is also very weird. Why is this T a capital T? Right earlier we saw uh, the United Kingdom, the UK, with a lowercase t. And when we talk about the United States, Uh, or the US, it's also a lowercase t. So again, not quite sure why this t is uppercase. It should be lowercase. Uh, the, the, there's a small difference here, whether you should use an uppercase t or a lowercase t. We call this country the United Kingdom because this kingdom is united. Based on the English grammar, you have to add the word the in order for uh, this term to make sense. But some places, the word the is part of the name. Uh, Haya, the city, The Hague. Uh, the name of the city is The Hague. So the word the is part of the name. So if, when you see this city in English, it, the T is always capitalized. But in this case, the word the is not part of the name. It's only required by the grammar. So it should be lowercase. And again, after Italy, uh, please remember to add a comma here. American students preferred programs in social sciences and humanities, business and management, and foreign languages. So first of all, there should be a the here, right? The, or the social sciences and humanities. The other thing I want to point out is, I keep saying you have to add this comma, and this is a good example of what happens if you don't have this comma. If it said. The social sciences and humanities, comma. 
business and management and foreign languages. The last three things, business, management, foreign languages. Which two should be put together? Of course, we know the meanings of these three words, so we can kind of understand. But the grammar doesn't help us. If you don't add a comma before the last thing on a list, the grammar could go both ways. It could be business and management and foreign languages. It could be business and management and foreign languages. So in order to avoid this problem, it's always good to add that last comma. Study abroad programs provide a valuable educational opportunity. But beyond the obvious educational benefits, Um, have we seen any obvious educational benefits in this article? Not really, right? This article just tells us so many people from this place study there, so many people from that place study here. But it didn't really tell us about these uh, obvious educational benefits. Um, and this is why I encourage students not to write the word obvious or of course or everyone knows. Because what if it's not obvious? What if it's not of course? What if some people don't know? When you write obvious and it's not obvious, then the reader starts to lose trust in you. They start to think maybe you as the writer didn't do a good job. So in this case, when it says the obvious educational benefits, that leads me to think uh, that the, the writer didn't really talk about the benefits. If there really are obvious educational benefits, you don't have to spend a lot of time explaining them. You can just mention them and we would all understand. But in this article, uh, I don't think any, there were very few benefits were mentioned. I actually can't remember any benefits that were mentioned. So a better way to write this part of the sentence would be beyond the educational benefits of A, B, and C. So you would at least point out what are those benefits. So beyond the obvious educational benefits, participants can exchange cultural information and become understanding and tolerant of other cultures. So first this word. Beyond. Beyond means to go farther than to do more than. Uh, in English we have the phrase to go over and beyond. Which means to do more. So beyond here means not just. So not just these benefits, there are other benefits to study abroad. Uh, and the sentence gives us two of these benefits to exchange cultural information. I'm not exactly sure what that means. What is cultural information? I think what it's trying to say is to exchange culture or cultural experience. I wouldn't call it cultural information. That sounds very weird. Like in Chinese, this might be 文化资讯. Like what is that? 
Does that mean like reading the Wikipedia article about a culture? I don't really understand. Uh, the other benefit is that you can become understanding and tolerant of other cultures. Uh, so we know understanding, right? You you uh, understand why someone would uh, believe something else or do something else because of their culture. The word tolerant comes from the verb tolerate. To tolerate means uh, to allow to continue. It's a bit, uh, it's not yet to accept, but at least you let it continue. You don't try to stop it. Uh, in Chinese, we usually call this rong ren. Um, but in terms of culture, we usually we call this rong na. Right, so it's not accept, it's just to tolerate rong na. Uh, and there's actually a lot of discussion about this word, tolerance, to tolerate other cultures. It just doesn't sound very friendly, right? When you meet people of other cultures, you say, uh, OK, I don't agree with you, but I'll let you believe what you want to believe. It sounds very passive aggressive, like uh, very uncomfortable, very unfriendly. Um, so in Chinese, there is another phrase that we use, uh, especially if you're in the government which is uh, to accept others. It's a more difficult thing to do, but if people try to accept others, instead of just tolerating others, it could lead to a more peaceful society. Uh, let's also look at the grammar to become understanding and tolerant of other cultures. Just means to understand and tolerate culture, other cultures. Uh, so this sentence structure is using adjectives, right? Understanding as an adjective, xionzi. Tolerant is an adjective. So if you want to use adjectives, uh, this is the sentence structure. As these students return to their home countries and take positions in business and government, future business and diplomatic relations may be enhanced. So first you have the word as. The word as in English, as I'm sure you remember, has many different meanings. But the central idea of all of these meanings is at the same time. Uh, now, when we were talking about the word while, we mentioned that at the same time can go in the same direction, can go in different directions. For the word as, at the same time, can also uh, go one after the other. So that would lead to cause and effect, in guanxi. Um, but however you understand the word as, it is always two things happening at the same time or together. So these people finish studying abroad, they go home and they take positions. Usually we would say they take up positions. There's the word up in the middle. In business and government. Uh, so these two words are used in an abstract sense, not which business, but the idea of business. Not which government, but the idea of government. So here they are used as uncountable nouns, because they are abstract ideas. Uh, and 
uh, and then it says future business and diplomatic relations 外交关系, may be enhanced. The word enhanced is also kind of strange here. Usually we would say improved, right? It would become better. Enhanced usually means uh, to become. Let's see, how, how is a good way to describe this? Something that is already good and you make it better. Uh, you make it more specific. You make it better in more specific ways. Uh, whereas the word improve simply means on a general like good to bad scale, you move toward good. So in this sentence, we don't know whether these business and diplomatic relations are good or not already, like right now. So we can only use the word enhanced if they are already good. Uh, since we don't know whether they are currently good or not, the word improved would be a better choice. I think this is also from the Chinese. Enhanced is probably zhenjing. Um, I'm not sure if the relations are already bad. Can you say in Chinese, I think that doesn't make sense either. In Chinese, we would probably say like or something. Yeah, so it, it, the word enhanced doesn't really work here. Improved would be better. OK, last sentence. Study abroad programs do more than educate individuals. They may affect future relationships between countries. Aha, I said last sentence, but it gave us two sentences. Uh, they can do more than A, they may also do B. So first of all, I would add the word just right here. Do more than just educate individuals. Do more than only educate individuals. And then because this is a complete sentence, and this is also a complete sentence, in order to put two complete sentences together, uh, you have to use one of a few fixed strategies. One of the strategies is to use the semicolon, fen hao. The semicolon tells us that these two complete sentences are related to each other. It does not tell us how they are related. It just tells us there is some kind of connection. Um, and th this last sentence, right? They may affect future relationships between countries. I think is not optimistic enough. By the end of the essay, you're trying to show the reader why this thing is important how it can change the future. And in fact, in line 40 to 41, it does say that these relations may be enhanced or improved. So you're looking toward um, the good things in the future. But this last sentence may affect. Affect can go both ways. You can affect something to make it better or you can affect something to make it worse. So to me, this last sentence is not powerful enough. Uh, I would say they, instead of they may affect future relationships, I would say they can help build stronger relationships. Right, that sounds good, right? Very positive, stronger relationships. OK, so we have gone through this article in detail. Do you have questions?
Is there some part that you want me to repeat? Do you want me to explain something in Chinese? OK, so we have first read this article very slowly. And then we have uh, very carefully gone through each sentence to uh, make sure the meaning is clear. Now I want to play uh, someone reading this article in a normal speed. We already understand what it's saying, so hopefully you can keep up with this faster reading.
Uh, you might have noticed that the reader has an accent. I think he's Australian. Uh, so he said when he was reading numbers, he added the word and uh, between the hundreds and the tens. And when he said zero, like uh, 0 0.6, he said not 0.6. Not is N-A-U-G-H-T. It means nothing or zero. N-A-U-G-H-T. Not. OK, let's take a short break.
Okay, let's take a closer look at the vocabulary on page 13. Most of these words we have seen in the article, but some of them are not, uh, we have not seen before. Uh, first one, abroad, uh, is an adverb. Well, it says noun, it should be an adverb. It just means uh, overseas, in a foreign country, away from home. You can go abroad, travel abroad, study abroad. Um, the word comes from a, which means at a place. It tells us uh, that the next word is a, some kind of uh, place adverb. And broad, broad means wide, far, distant. So abroad means in a faraway place. Um, today it means in a foreign country. The next word aspect. Aspect is um, one direction of looking at something. So like let's say you have like a diamond, right? You can look at it from this direction is one aspect. You can look at it from another direction is a different aspect. Uh, in Chinese we call this mian xiang. Humanities. Uh, we talked about this is usually the humanities. Uh, and as you can tell, the root of this word is human. So the humanities are the subjects that every human should understand or that every human will. Uh, it is connected to every human. So things related to like language, thinking, which is philosophy, um, how we live, which is sociology, so our culture, which is anthropology, um, things like that, history, where we have been before. All of these are humanities. The next word, interdependence, which means that uh, two things are connected to each other and that you cannot separate these two things. Uh, we can divide this word into two halves. Inter means between. Dependence or depend means that uh, this relationship has to exist. Eli, right? Reliance, dependence. So interdependence is usually thought of as the opposite of independence, duri. Because if you're independent, you don't have to rely on anyone else. But you, if you are interdependent, if two people are interdependent, then these two people rely on each other. The next word, affect. Uh, have an influence on. Or you can also just use the word influence as a verb. To influence something or someone is to affect them. Enhance. To make something that is already good better. Exchange. This is also an interesting word. We can divide this into X, which means uh, outside, and change. So you change something, but you change it by giving it to someone else, right? Some the other person is outside, and the outside person gives you something. So that's an exchange. Gain. To, to get something is to gain something. Usually it's a good thing. Record, we talked about this. Uh, a record is of course um, 
something that is like the best or the highest or the most of something. Um, and you can use it as an adjective, a record win, which means that this win has broken uh, records. Tolerant, we also talked about this. Uh, and if you want an example of tolerate or tolerant as a negative word, you can listen to the Taylor Swift song Tolerate It, which is entirely negative. Well known, which means famous. It could also mean infamous, which is bad. Famous is good, infamous is bad but both of them mean that it is well known. Um, by the way, it's an adjective, right? So you can compare well known, better known, best known. So just like good, good, better, best, well, better, best. Uh, and then steadily, sorry, steadily comes from the adjective steady, which means a stable, uh, not sudden changes. Then we have two other words. Uh, I'm not sure why we have these two words. But since we have them, we can talk about them. The first word is I-20. Uh, the complete name is Form I-20. This is the government form that you have to fill out before you go on exchange to the United States. It's an application for an exchange visa, Qianzhen. Uh, U.S. government forms are all called form and then like a number. So this is form I-20. The most famous U.S. government form is form 1040. This is income tax. So U.S. citizens have to fill out a form 1040 every year. The next word is sibling, which means brother or sister, sozu. This can also be used as a metaphor, yu. So if uh, two things are closely related, we can say that they are siblings. Uh, so we can say like, uh, Chinese language and Chinese history are sibling uh, fields, sibling subjects, because they're very closely related. OK, do you have questions about these words? OK, if we go to the next page, you will see some practice questions. Let's do these questions. Um, so it's a matching question. You have words on the left and meanings on the right. Uh, nine questions. I will give you three minutes. Uh, and then we'll compare answers.
OK, let's check your answers. On the left, we have the words abroad, trend, enhance, exchange, gain, humanities, record, tolerant, and well-known. On the right, let's see which meaning goes with which word. A, to increase good things such as value, power, or beauty. Which word is this? To increase good things. Uh, when you do questions, remember to choose the best answer, even if it's not entirely correct. In this case, A is enhance, three, to increase good things. B, the best, highest, or lowest yet done. Which word is this? OK, usually I would read your lips, so we can switching, but you're all wearing masks. So uh, this word is seven record. The best, highest or lowest yet done uh, in this. The word yet means so far up to now. C to obtain something. This one is five gain. D acceptance of other people's behavior or beliefs. This one is eight tolerant. But remember, it's not actually acceptance. It's almost acceptance. E, change or development towards something new, to go in a new direction, to show a tendency. This one is two, trend. In Chinese, we call this one chu si. Um, also notice in the definition here, American English usually does not have this S. Um, it's not a rule, it's a Tendency, uh, Usually, American English will not have the S, and British English will have the S. Right. So this word, tendency, uh, a general direction, a preference for a direction. It's a general preference for a direction. In Chinese, uh, Next, famous, F, which one is this? Nine, well known. Next one, G, to or in another country. This one is one, abroad. H, studies of the arts. Uh, so the best answer here is six, humanities. Uh, notice that it says the arts, right? Not study of art, study of the arts. Uh, in the Western tradition, there are uh, seven arts. Let me see if I can remember them. Painting, music, sculpture. I can't remember them, but there are seven arts. Uh, so it's called the arts. Poetry, number four. Uh, what else? I'm missing two. And then seven is photography. Uh, eight is uh, movies. So what are five and six? If you want to, you can look online. 
And then last one, I, to give and receive something in return is for exchange. Uh, and the phrase in return means uh, to exchange. So I give you something, you give me something back. This is what in return means. OK, do you have questions about this, uh, these nine? OK, let's do the second set of questions, comprehension questions based on the reading. Uh, so when you answer these questions, um, I also want you to find where the information is in the article. Uh, and I will call your names to ask your answers. So 11 questions, I'll give you seven minutes. Hmm, maybe it's not fair uh, because most of you don't have a textbook. Let's actually no, let's do these together. So uh, question one, what is the most popular type of study abroad? So if we go back to the article, the most popular type of study abroad, university study is the most popular type of study abroad. Um, and I looked for this information near the beginning of the article because this kind of information is very general and important. It's not very specific. Usually uh, an English article will begin with more general information and then will slowly give you more specific information. So because this is general information, I looked for it near the beginning of the essay. Question two, how many Taiwanese students studied abroad? So these are Taiwanese students going to other countries. So we will look for uh, the first sentence of each paragraph to see which one talks about Taiwan. Taiwan students who studied abroad. OK, so it should be this this uh, paragraph. Most students went to the US. And no, our question is asking how many? So here, 48,103 students. This is how many? Question three, what is the most popular destination for Taiwanese students studying abroad? We just saw this one, it's the United States. Question four, what are the most popular majors for foreign students in the United States? So foreign students who study in the United States, what is what are so more than one? What are the most popular majors? So again, we look at the beginning sentence of each paragraph. We look for which one talks about foreign students in the United States? This one. So the answer is uh, business and management, engineering, math and computer sciences, or one of the social sciences is the answer to what are the most popular majors. Question five. How many foreign students were enrolled in American universities and colleges? So again, we look for the first sentence in a paragraph that talks about foreign students in American uh, schools. So most popular majors, no. Overseas Chinese in Taiwan, no. American students in study abroad, no. Study abroad programs, no. So maybe it's somewhere earlier. Ah, so this many foreign students in American universities and colleges. 
So that's the answer. It's asking how many. So the answer is approximately 586,323. Very strange. It gives us a very specific number, and then it says approximately. Kind of strange. Next question. How many Taiwanese students studied in the US? OK, so again, we look for the first sentence in a paragraph that mentions uh, Taiwanese students studying abroad. So these are Taiwan students who studied abroad. Maybe it's in this paragraph. Went to the US. Uh, It doesn't give us a specific number. Maybe uh, the number will appear somewhere else. Most popular majors for foreign students in the US? No. Overseas Chinese in Taiwan? No. American students in study abroad programs? No. Study abroad conclusion? No. Okay, so we go back to the top. Introduction? No information. University study? Foreign students in American universities and colleges. So this is about students in the US, so not this one. India, China, Korea, top three countries. So this is about countries to the US. Maybe it's here. Here. Taiwan ranks fifth in US international student enrollment with 28,017 students attending uh, school in the US. So it's asking us how many Taiwanese students in the US. Your answer is 28,017. See, this is why uh, when we were going through this article, I emphasized what is each paragraph talking about. Once you know what each paragraph is talking about, it's very easy to find the answer to questions like these. OK, seven, how many foreign students came to Taiwan to study? So we're looking for the paragraph about foreign students in Taiwan. In addition to overseas Chinese attending programs in Taiwan, a steadily increasing number of foreign students. OK, this one. In 2002, 6,380 foreign students enrolled in programs in Taiwan. So that's the answer, total foreign students 6,380. Next question. What's the most popular subject for foreigners studying in Taiwan? So it looks like it should be the same paragraph about foreign students in Taiwan. Popular subject. Aha, popular topics. Were the humanities mainly Chinese language? So if there are only 123 students who are studying things that are not the humanities, then when it says that Chinese language is the most popular humanities subject, this probably also means that it is the most popular subject of all of the subjects. My Chinese. So when this question is asking the most popular subject, the answer is probably Chinese language. Nine, which country sends the most students to Taiwan? So it looks like we're still in the same paragraph. Uh, most are Asian. The Japanese were the largest group studying in Taiwan. So your answer is Japan.
Question 10, what programs do American students prefer when they study abroad? So we're looking for the paragraph about American students going abroad. And which topic or subject is the most popular? This one, American students are also participating in study abroad programs. So the answer should be in this paragraph. Most popular program. Let's see, number of students, increase, most popular destinations. So not what we're looking for. UK, Italy, Spain, American students preferred programs. OK, this should be the answer. In social sciences and humanities, business and management, and foreign languages. So that's your answer. These are the programs that American students like to study abroad. Social sciences and humanities, business and management, and foreign languages. Uh, 11, what are the most popular destinations for American students studying abroad? OK, we just saw that same paragraph. The most popular destinations were the UK, Italy and Spain. So that's your answer. So again, we were able to find these answers easily because we remembered what each paragraph is talking about. So just by reading the first line of each paragraph, we could see whether the answer would be in that paragraph or in another paragraph. Do you have questions about this one? OK, uh, let's go to page 16. So here are some common questions that you can prepare for if you want to study in graduate school, either in Taiwan or in a foreign country. Um, you don't have to like fill this out and submit it to the school. But these are questions that the school might ask you. Uh, so it's always good to have to be prepared for these kinds of questions. Uh, we can look at uh, some vocabulary words. Questionnaire means a survey. It's a it's a list of questions you give to someone to answer. In Chinese, we call this wen jun, a questionnaire. Date of birth is not exactly the same as birthday. A birthday is just the month and the day. But a date of birth includes the year, so month, day and year. Nationality. As you can see from the root nation, this is what country are you from? Grade point average, GPA, this is a way to present your grades. We'll talk a bit about this later. There's a way to calculate your GPA. Um, usually, if you are applying overseas, you don't need to calculate your own GPA. When you print your transcript, this one, uh, transcript is your uh, record of your grades it will all automatically calculate your GPA for you. So you don't have to worry too much about this. Uh, transcript, it's a record of your grades. Uh, and then here you have some other possible tests that you may need to take. GRE is for um, different fields of study for graduate school. So if you uh, study, if you want to go abroad to study like business, you would have a business related GRE. If you want to study language, you have a language related GRE. The GMAT is for math, graduate level math.
this is also important. When you list items, you want to start from the present and work slowly back into the past. So you would list the newest thing first, and then the second newest, and you go all the way down to the oldest. So it's in reverse time order. Languages spoken, read, written. Include level of proficiency, which means how good are you? Um, people will look at these three separately, spoken, read, and written. Uh, there are many cases where uh, people will say, I can read French, but this means that they can't uh, listen and understand to uh, listening to French. They can't speak French, but they can read French. Uh, and being able to read a language is better than nothing. So when uh, school asks you about your language proficiency, your skills, uh, they will also ask you to note which of the four language skills, speaking, reading, writing, and listening. Uh, and here you have three levels. Fluent means you're very good at this language. Good means you're okay. Fair actually means you're not very okay. It's a polite way of saying not good. Fair, of course, usually means uh, everybody is equal. Gongping de. Club and organization membership, Setuan. Include any offices held. So if you're a club officer, like club president, vice president, uh, secretary, Mishu, treasurer, that kind of thing. Uh, here you have names of teachers who would be willing to write you a letter of recommendation. Uh, in Chinese, we call this tui jian xing. Right, not recommendation letter. It's a letter of recommendation. How will you pay for your graduate school education? I I'm not sure that schools will actually ask you this, but it's a very important question to think about. And then finally, if you apply to Western schools, especially American schools, they care about what makes you different. Um, every year, thousands of people apply to Harvard University. And of course, so Harvard will look at their test scores, will look at what they have uh, done during their high school years, and they will remain with a group of very highly qualified students. These students are equally good. There's no way to choose between these students. The problem is that the number of these students is still more than Harvard can take. So how does Harvard decide? By this, what makes you different? Harvard is more likely to take you if you can prove that you are different from everybody else. So this is something that American universities especially care about. So here you have different kinds of diversity. Diversity means difference. This word, diversity. Geographic diversity. Maybe you're from a place that nobody else is from. Ethnic diversity. Maybe your uh, your ethnicity, uh, is unique. Experience in different educational systems and cultures. Overcoming, OK, not diversity. It should be overcoming adversity. Adversity means obstacles, something that stands in your way, that prevents you from succeeding. So it should be overcoming adversity.
next one. Political awareness of regional and international issues. So do you know what's going on in the world, especially in the world around you? So if you're from Taiwan, they will care about whether you know what's going on in East Asia, Dongya Zivin. Multicultural, multilingual. Maybe your background is from more than one culture. Maybe you can speak more than one language. Or in your case, more than two languages, Chinese and English. Work experience, travel experience. Uh, these are harder to prove that you're different because uh, most people who apply to universities will have some kind of work experience <coughs> and some kind of travel experience. So if you want to talk about these, your work experience or travel experience should be very special. Not just like, you know, visited Pingdong or something. Non-traditional family situation or living environment. Uh, which means that your family is not one father, one mother, and like one brother or sister. The maybe your situation is less common. That might give you a different perspective, a different way of looking at life. And then like if there's something really special, other unusual experience. And you will often see this. Be specific, which means add details. Make everything as clear as you can. And then the last question here, a brief statement of why you want to attend graduate school and what you hope to accomplish here. Uh, in English, we call this a statement of purpose. What is your purpose in coming here? What is your goal? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to get from coming here? A statement of purpose. So if you are planning to going uh, to go to graduate school, these are some of the ideas that you can keep in mind and prepare um, before you apply. Page 18 teaches you how to calculate your GPA. Most American universities use a four point GPA, which means the highest number is four. In Taiwan, there is no standard. Some schools use four, some schools use 4.3, some schools use five. So if you do want to apply to a school somewhere else other than Taiwan, uh, you may have to explain to that school uh, which kind of GPA system your school uses. Um, of course, when we talk about grades, we don't say GPA, right? We say 100 points, uh, 90 points, that kind of thing. You only see your GPA when you print out your complete transcript. Li jie chen ji dan. Li nian chen ji dan. Uh, and also most Western universities use letter grades. Uh, currently, I think it's A, B, C and F, just four letters. Uh, the letter D was canceled. Some Taiwanese universities also use letter grades, uh, but in class the teacher will still use 100 points. OK. Um, Let's take a break. I'll give you some more time to move to the other classroom and I will see you there at 11.10. How many Okay, that's been Chen.
Okay, let's begin. If you want subtitles, please remember to write it into the teams. So let's look at page 19. On page 19, here we have some tips for writing. And this is the most important part of writing. Who are you writing for? You have to understand your audience so that you can write something that they will be interested in and that they will understand. So here it tells us to analyze your audience. Analyze in Chinese it is fishy. Right. So to get to know your audience and anticipate questions from readers. Anticipate means to predict, to expect. And so you have to know your audience. And so here it gives you some questions to think about. How old will your readers be? How well do most of them understand English? What are they interested in? Do they have any dislikes or prejudices? Uh, so if you think that there is something they will not like, you should probably avoid writing about those things. And how much time will your reader have to read your article? Another way to ask this question is, how much time can you convince them to give you to read your article? The more interesting your writing is, the more time your reader will be willing to give you. Uh, so based on your answers to these questions, you can adjust your article. Okay, here uh, we're talking about writing an autobiography or a self introduction. As we just saw, graduate schools will often ask you to introduce yourself. So, here the point is to try to come up with something that examiners will remember. Um, Admissions officers look at hundreds and thousands of applications, and each one has a self introduction. How can you help them remember you? How can you stand out from the crowd? Um, so the textbook gives us two uh, self introduction. Openings. So these are not the complete self introduction. These are just the beginning. Um, and we can read them and we can think about which one would help the reader remember this person better. So let's read to them. The first one I am Timmy Yen. I have a younger brother and sister. We live with my parents and grandparents. We have been taught to take responsibility for ourselves. I always appreciate that I have such a happy family. My parents are very open-minded and not so traditional. They often encourage me to try my best. They have told me that since I was little, Oh, sorry, they have told me that since I was little. Also, they respect children, use communication and suggestion instead of orders. Now we're each working or studying hard in our fields. So after reading this, what do you remember? 
not a lot. There's nothing very special about this kind of self-introduction. The information is all supposed to be important. So how do you let the reader feel like this information is important? Um, before we look at the next example, I want to point out a grammar mistake. They respect children and use communication and suggestion instead of orders. You cannot connect two sentences using only a comma. You have to use a comma plus some kind of connection, like and or but. So let's look at the next one. I'm staring at the computer screen and thinking about the big challenge. How to write a brief but appealing autobiography. When I was struck with confusion, a little bird told me, just try your best. What a familiar encouragement. My parents have always told me that since I was a little girl. Although I grew up in a three generation family, my open minded parents were not affected by the old manners. They respect children, use communication and suggestion instead of orders. My younger sister, brother, and I were taught to take responsibility for ourselves. Now we're each working or studying hard in our field. I always appreciate that I have such a happy family. So you can immediately feel that this second example is more interesting, even though the information is very similar. In fact, I think it's basically the same information. But instead of going uh, in order, right? I, my name, my siblings, my parents, this second example tries to make a connection with the reader. I am staring at the computer screen, thinking about what to write. The connection here is with anybody who has had to write this kind of thing before. We all know that feeling. And the answer, just try your best, connects with the thing that the writer's parents have always told her. So this is a connection between the first opening situation and the main idea of the second paragraph. And from that connection, uh, then you slowly fill in the rest of the information. If you look only at the second paragraph, it is still boring. It's the first paragraph that tries to tell a story, that tries to connect the reader with the writer. That is what makes this example more interesting than the other example. Uh, and of course, it doesn't hurt that this example uses better English. Uh, for example, she says appealing. Appealing means interesting, attractive. To be struck with confusion. So this is describing confusion as like a, a bolt of lightning from the sky and it hits you and it makes you confused. Struck with confusion. A little bird told me, this is an older English phrase. A little bird told me just means somebody told me. Or this idea came from somewhere. Um, and this phrase, a little bit told me, is the reason why Twitter uses the, the icon of a bird. Because Twitter is about talking to people, passing information around. 
like a little bird told you. This example also uses more complex sentences. Instead of just SVO, SVO, here you have although to connect two halves of this long sentence. Old manners is a very old way of saying customs, traditions, ways of doing things. So old manners is traditional uh, beliefs, traditional ways to behave. Uh, you have the same grammar mistake. Here, you probably want to add a comma. And notice uh, the order of these people. My younger sister, brother, and I. In a list of people, if it is the subject of the sentence, you should put yourself last. If it is the object of a sentence, you put yourself first. So you can see that even though it's the same material, the different ways of writing can give you a more or less interesting uh, self introduction. So when you write something, pay attention not just to what you say, but how you say it. Okay, e-research. This one, um, I will let you do uh, for practice if you want to. So you can do it for um, and it says small groups. You don't have to do small groups. Um, let's modify this a little bit. If you want to use this chance to practice writing, here's what you can do. First, let's look at 1B. And this one is talking about what uh, let's see. What are the important factors to consider in choosing a graduate program? You can think about this question. You don't have to interview anyone. Uh, so after you think about this question, find somebody else who has experience studying abroad. Uh, it says your parent sibling, professor, friend. Most of your professors studied abroad, so you can talk to a professor. Uh, and then like write down their experiences and see if uh, their experiences answer your question. What important factors? And then go to 2B. This one. Think of at least one. One question is enough. You don't have to have two. Think of at least one question that you still have about studying abroad. Uh, pick a program and write an email to me, not to the program. Write it to me, and I will. Use, I will look at this email as a piece of writing and I will correct it and I will hand it back to you. So this is a chance for you to practice your writing. Um, but you still need to choose a program. Each program is different. So depending on which program, your questions will also be different. So if you want to take this chance to practice your writing, uh, First, do 1B. Think about what kinds of things you want to know about studying abroad. 
Then do 1A, find someone with experience and ask them questions. And then do 2B, think of at least one question that you want to ask and pick a graduate school and write an email to them, but send the email to me and I will mark your email and correct it and hand it back to you all right, to help improve your writing. Because remember, for the final exam, you have to write a refined email. So this is a good chance to practice. Uh, and then below you have an example of this kind of email. I don't really think this is a good example because look at the questions that this student asks. Could you please send me some information about degree choices, application procedures, and deadlines? Are there any tests I must take? Is there a minimum score I must have to enter your school? Can you give me some information about tuition, which is the cost of the school, and living arrangements for foreign students? This information should be online. You should be able to find this information online. Uh, remember, this textbook was written in like 2003. Uh, so at that time, you would write a letter or write an email to ask for this information. Um, but today, you can just look online. So the format of this email is pretty good, but the questions are terrible. Please think of better questions. OK, so that's something that you can uh, do to practice your writing. OK, so let's do uh, discussion practice to give you a chance to talk in English. Uh, grab a partner. Uh, and talk about these four questions. Why do you think university study is the most popular type of study abroad? Would you study abroad? Why or why not? If yes, what would you like to study? Where would you like to go? And what would affect your choice of where to study? So question four is basically asking uh, after question three, it's asking why, what reasons. OK, I'll give you uh, 10 minutes to talk with your partner in English about these questions. In English. I'm <laughs> 
Um, so let's move on to question B. Question A is about your personal situation. Part B is more objective, objective one. Uh, think about studying abroad. What are some advantages and what are some disadvantages? You can talk with your partner to come up with uh, at least three advantages and at least three disadvantages. Uh, another five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. 
English, please. It sounds like you guys are pretty much finished discussing. So now let's move on to part C, role playing. You guys can practice your acting skills. So we have three situations. You can choose one. In the first situation, one person wants to study abroad. The other person is a mom or dad who wants to keep your child in Taiwan. The second situation, uh, one of you wants to study abroad. The other person is the boyfriend or girlfriend who wants to keep the person in Taiwan. The third situation, uh, one person is thinking about studying abroad, not sure yet. The other person is a university career counselor. Uh, 
and you two are talking about uh, whether the first person should study abroad. So in this practice, you can use some of the ideas that you thought about, the advantages and the disadvantages. So with your partner, choose one of these uh, situations. Take a few minutes to prepare separately, and then you can begin uh, acting your roles in English. Uh, the next page has to find some examples. So the first example is a mother and son. The mom says, which school do you plan to apply to? The son says, well, my first choice is the University of Chicago because they have a well-known business school. Mom, but that's in the U.S. You should enroll in graduate school in Taiwan because if you study abroad, you'll be all alone. Son. That's true, but after graduation, I'll be able to get a really good job when I return to Taiwan because of all the knowledge and experience I'll gain. Also, it will really enhance my English ability. Mom, well, I think you should talk to your father. So you can see from this example, you don't have to make it very long. It can be short. But, you know, discuss between the two characters. Um, have them talk about the reasons, the advantages, and disadvantages.
Are you guys doing the process? If you finish uh, with your practice, choose another situation and go again.
When you speak English, the point is not to have perfect English. The point is to communicate, to make the other person understand you. As long as you can communicate, it's good English. So don't worry about perfect English. Just try to speak and practice. That when you do another situation, uh, switch roles. Have the other partner be the person who wants to study abroad. 